Today we're going to discuss chapter 3, Chemical Reactions and Reaction Stoichiometry. Learning objectives for today are explain the mole as a relative mass unit. Also, you'll be able to determine the molar masses of atoms and molecules. You'll convert between mass, moles, and number of atoms or molecules. Also, by given a chemical formula, you'll be able to calculate the mass percent of each element. As well, you will use percent composition data to calculate the empirical formula of a compound. Also, you will describe how combustion analysis is used to determine the, per the percent composition of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a compound. You will use coefficients to balance chemical reactions. And finally, you will calculate the qualities of substance involved in chemical reactions. And finally, this is the last one. You will determine limited rea reagents, theoretical yields, and percent yields of chemical reactions. Stoichiometry basically is the study of the mass relationship in chemistry based on the law of conservation of mass. In, seven, in 1789, Lavoisier mentioned that we may lay it down as an incontestable axiom that in all the operation of art and nature, nothing is created. An equal amount of matter exists before and after the experiment. Upon this principle, the whole art of performing chemical experiment depends. So basically, he established there the law of conservation of mass, where you can't create nor destroy uh, the mass, the matter. You can transform it, but you will never destroy it or create matter. So let's introduce what is a chemical equations. Chemical equations are consist representation of chemical reactions. Here we have an example of two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen will produce two moles of water. So this arrow represents and make the difference between what we have at the beginning and what we have after the reaction. So here we have the reactants and here we have the products. We're gonna talk a little bit uh, more about later. Here we have the two moles of hydrogen. He, this is one mole of hydrogen. We can see the two uh, atoms of hydrogen to create the molecule phase 2 as well as one mole of oxygen and this will produce two moles or two particles of water H2O, two hydrogen and one oxygen. So here we have another chemical equation. We have here methane plus two oxygen will produce carbon dioxide plus two moles of water. In the left, we're going to find always the reactant. They're going to be in the left side of the equation before the arrow, this arrow here. And at the right side of that arrow, you're going to have the products. They're going to be always in the right side of that arrow. Here we have the sphere representations of that chemical equation. We have methane. We have the two moles of oxygen. We have one mole of carbon dioxide plus two mole of water. Also, we can rewrite this equation like this. This is the, uh, also uh, the chemical equation. But most of the time, we need to check if we have the same amount of atoms in each side. Remember that in each chemical reaction, we need to conserve the mass. Okay, We can't create nor destroy any kind of matter. So here we have one carbon, we have four hydrogen, and four oxygen completely in the reactants. Four hydrogen, one carbon, and two times two, four oxygen. In the products, we have one carbon, we have here four hydrogen, and two oxygen from here, and two from here, because we have two moles of water, that will be four oxygen. So we have a balanced chemical equation in this case, because we have the same amount of atoms in each side of the equation. Also, in the chemical equation, you will need to uh, mention the state of the reactants and product, and they are so most of the time uh, shown in parentheses. G is going to be for gas, L is going to be for liquid, S is going to be for solid, and aqueous is going to be for solution in water. Okay, because sometimes we're going to have pure liquid, 
Okay, for example, water is a pure liquid, so you can use an L because it's not a solution. But if you have a solution of glucose or a solution of uh, sodium chloride, you may use AQ to that represent the AQ solution. Okay, so you can have you can these are the most common for um, abbreviations that we're gonna see to represent the states of the reactants or product. G for gas, L for liquid, S for solid, and AQ for aqueous solution. Also, another important part of the chemical equations are the coefficients. They are inserted to balance the equation to follow the law of conservation of mass. So these are this is the coefficient. It's a one, but because the own representation of the molecule represents one, we don't use a one here. We have another coefficient here that is two, one, and two. So the coefficients for this equation is one, two, one, two. Okay, and they're going to vary depending on the balance that we need to do to obtain the same amount of atoms in each side. Okay, but it's important that the coefficients goes in front of the molecules. Why do we add coefficients instead of changing subscripts, subscripts to balance? If we change coefficients, we change the amount of that compound. Here we have, instead of one, two molecules of water. If you change the subscript of here and add a two for oxygen because you need two more oxygen, then instead of changing the amount of the molecule, you are changing the whole molecule. You will have a new molecule with new identities and new pr properties. As you can see here, this is oxygen peroxide. Okay, so this is totally different from this. So that's why when you are doing the balance equation, you will always add coefficients in front of the molecule. Never you will change the subscript of one of the molecule to try to add more or remove of, uh, remove some of them. So always add the coefficients, never change the subscript. Hydrogen and oxygen can make also water or hydrogen peroxide. We have here two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen will produce two moles of water. Four hydrogen, four hydrogen, two oxygen, two oxygen. And you can see also the state of each of them, gas, gas, and liquid because water is pure. So you will always use the L when you have pure liquids, okay? And here we have H2, hydrogen, plus oxygen, one mole of each. This will produce hydrogen peroxide. And also this is a pure liquid, so you use a nail okay, to represent the state of hydrogen peroxide. So there, can you, you can see there that by changing okay, the uh, coefficients, you will have uh, a different number of uh, the same compound. If you change the uh, subscript, you will have a totally different compound. Now, let's uh, show you three different types of chemical reaction, the combination reactions, the decomposition reactions, and the combustion reactions. So the combination reactions, they are when you, have, when you have two or more substances in a reaction to form one product, okay? So for example, here we have magnesium plus oxygen to produce the magnesium oxide. You have two reactants to produce one product, and this is a combination reaction. Also, these are different examples. Uh, nitrogen plus one mole of nitrogen plus three moles of hydrogen will produce two moles of ammonium. So you could have one, two different reactants to produce just one type of product. The same thing here with C3H6 plus Br2. This will produce one of CH, C3H6 Br2. So here we have also another example of a combination reaction. When you start with two reactants, it can produce just one product. Now the decomposition reactions are where you have a product, when you have a reactant, and you break that reactant into two or more substances, okay? So here we have, for example, calcium carbonate as a solid. When it reacts, it'll produce the calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide. So both, you have two reactants from one, I mean two products, sorry, from one reactant. The same thing with uh, potassium uh, perchlorate here. You have two moles of potassium chloride 
plus uh, the oxygen. Okay, so you have from one a molecule, you produce two molecules. The same thing here with the sodium azide. Here, one mole of this, or um, one add one molecule of the sodium azide will produce, actually it's formula unit because these are ion, but uh, you will use one, you will produce one sodium and three nitrogen. Okay, so in this case, is that important thing is that you have one reactant and that reactant will produce two molecules of products. The combustion reactions, the first one is that the first characteristic of these uh, reactions are that they are rap uh, general rapid reactions that produce a flame. And secondly, most of them of often they evolve oxygen in the air as the reactants. So we have methane here plus oxygen, this will produce CO2 and water. So most of the time, oxygen is involved in this type of reaction. So it's pretty easy to um, identify. Here we have methane plus oxygen producing carbon dioxide and water. And he, this one is propane plus uh, five moles of oxygen will produce uh, three uh, moles of carbon dioxide and water. In this case, because you're adding heat, that water will be evaporated. So that's why we use the uh, subscript of the gas. Okay, so we have this water is going to be in gas state. We're going to have also carbon dioxide and water and uh, the uh, methane or propane also as a gas. Now let's talk about the formula weight. The formula weight is the sum of the atomic weight for the atoms in a chemical formula. This is the quantitative significance of a formula. The formula weight of calcium chloride, CaCl2, would be calcium. You have just one calcium, so it's going to be 1 times the atomic mass of calcium. And chloride, you have two of them, so you're going to uh, multiply 2 times the atomic mass of uh, chlorine. And then the total is going to be 110.99. And this is the formula weight for calcium chloride, okay? When you just calculate by using the atomic mass of each as the component of the molecular formula. And always remember, if you have more than one, you need to multiply that molar uh, atomic mass by the times of how many do you have in the molecule. So here we have two chlorides that we multiply two times the atomic mass of chloride, one times the atomic mass of calcium. And that will give, give us the formula weight. Uh, the molecular weight is the sum of the atomic weight of the atoms in a molecule. For the molecule of ethane, C2H6, the molecular weight would be how many carbon we have here? Two, two times the atomic mass of the carbon. And here we have six hydrogen, so it's going to be six times the atomic mass of hydrogen. And this will be the total of that multiplication. It's going to be 30.070 atomic mass unit. Okay, so this is basically the molecular weight for that compound, C2H6. Ionic compounds and formula. Remember that ionic compounds exist with a three-dimensional order of ions. There is no simple group of atoms to call a molecule. As such, ionic compounds use empirical formulas and formulas weight not molecular weight. One can find here the percentage of the mass of each of the, uh, the atoms of the compound that comes from each of the elements in the compound by using this equation. So the percent of the element will be the number of atoms times the atomic weight divided by the uh, formula weight of the compound, okay, times 100. This is the percent of composition. So, for example, the percentage in carbon in ethane, we have two, okay, two atoms of carbon in ethane. This is the atomic mass of carbon. We multiply two times this and divide it by the uh, molecular weight of uh, ethane, okay? That is 30.070. So, when we do that, we multiply this time. This is going to be 24.022 divided by 30.070 times 100. The percent of carbon will be... 79.887 and because this compound is just carbon and hydrogen 
what will be the percent of hydrogen? If this is 79%, the difference between 100 and 79.887% will be the percent of the hydrogen, okay? Because it's 100, you're going to have carbon and hydrogen. So 70% will be, 70.9% will be hydrogen and, I mean carbon, and the difference from 100 will be the percent of hydrogen. Now let's introduce you the Avogadro's number. As the same way as you have, for example, a dozen, a dozen means 12, okay? When you mention a six pack, you think about six, okay? And those numbers represent a quantity, um, an amount, okay? So the Avogadro's numbers also represent an amount. In a lab, we cannot work with individual molecules. They are really, really small. 6.02 times power of the 23rd atoms or molecule is an amount that brings used to lab to the lab site. It's one mole. So as the same way as one dozen represent 12, one mole will represent 6.02 times 10 to the power of, 30, uh, of 23rd atoms, molecules, or particles. Okay, they could be whatever. They could be atoms, they could be molecules, or they could be particles. The same way as you can have one dozen of Elephants, one dozen of cats, one dozen of, of, of cars, one dozen of nails. So the same way you can have 6.02 times to 10 to the power of 23rd atoms, molecules, or ions. And that amount represent one mole. So one mole of carbon and it has the mass of 12.0 grams. One mole of carbon has the gram has a mass of 12.00 grams. As well, one molecule of water has the atomic mass of 18.0. One mole of water will have the mass of 18.0 grams, okay? So in that case, the Avogadro's number represent the amount, this amount, and for this amount of molecules of water, for example, moles of water, we're gonna have 18.0 grams, okay? So for one mole of water that represents 6.02 times power of 10 23rd molecules of water, the mass of that amount of molecules is going to be 18.0 grams. And there is where you're going to find the molar mass. The molar mass is the mass divided by the num by one mole. So the molar mass of an element is the atomic weight for the element from the periodic table. If it's diatomic, it is twice that atomic weight. The formula weight that this is most of the time in atomic mass units will be the same number as the molar mass. There will be the units will be always grams per mole. So we have here one mole of oxygen inside this red balloon, and that mole of oxygen has a mass of 32.0 gram. Here we have one mole of water, and this mole of water will have a mass of 18.0 grams. And this is the mole of sodium chloride, one mole of sodium chloride. This has a mass of 58.45 gram. Okay, so this is basically the representation of three different um, compounds and three different amount, even though they are one mole, but you can see that they have, because they have different mass, they, they can have more space or less space. It also de depends on the state of the uh, compound. But you can see that when you have uh, different compounds, you're gonna have a different mass for the same amount. As I mentioned before, it says if we said one dozen of elephants, we'll have a specific weight. One dozen of pencil, we have a specific weight. Both of them, they are the same amount of particles. You're going to have 12 and 12, but the mass is going to be different. Okay, so that's what's happening here. One mole of oxygen, one mole of water, one mole of sodium chloride with different masses. So, moles. The moles are very useful because the moles are the only way that we can compare one compound to another compound or one compound to an atom. Then we need to use uh, that the units of moles to do that type of conversion or ratio or relationship. So from if we have grams, we can go from grams to mole by using a conversion factor that is the molar mass. As well, you can go from moles to mass by using the same molar mass, but flipped, okay? The same way if you are moles and you want to determine the formula units or the amount of particles, remember, 
We can have here formula units. We can have here number of ions. We can have here molecules. Okay, so one mole is going to determine also the amount of the particle. As well, as if we have the amount of the particles, we can calculate how many moles that amount represent. Okay, that amount of, of particles. We could have a number, a specific, a specific number of moles. So moles provide a bridge from the molecular scale to the real world scale. That is the purpose of the mole. So here we have a table with different uh, mole relationship. We have the atomic nitrogen, and we have here the molecular nitrogen. The atomic nitrogen, the molar mass, and the formula weight is 14, while the uh, formula weight and molar mass of nitrogen is 28. Because it's double, you have two particles of nitrogen. Now, when you're talking about atomic nitrogen, 6.02 times 10 power of 23rd atoms of nitrogen will have this, this mass. And for N2, okay, we're going to have the same concept. 6.02 times 10 power of 33rd molecules of nitrogen. So this amount, that is the same as this, but from nitrogen, diatomic molecule will have a molar mass of 28. Silver, silver as an atom will have a molar mass of 107.9, and this will be uh, the representation of the mass of 6.02 times power of 23rd um, atoms of silver. If you have a nine of silver, it's going to be the same as this, as the um, atoms of silver, you're going to have the same molar mass and also the same number of particles, but instead of atoms, now you're talking about ions, okay? But the number is going to be the same because it's one mole, the Avogadro's number. And for barium chloride, it's going to depend. If you're talking just about barium chloride, the molar mass will be 208.2, and you can represent the number of formula units as this. 6.02 times 10 power 23rd formula units of barium chloride. But if you want to separate it by ions, you have just one ion of barium. So that means that you're going to have 6.02 times power of 23rd ions of barium, while you have two of chlorine. So that's you multiply two times this value, and this will be the representation of the number of ions that you will have in the dissociation of barium chloride. Okay, so basically, as you can see here, for example, nitrogen as an atom, nitrogen as a molecule, the, the Avogadro's number is going to be the same, 6.02 times power of 23rd, as well as atoms and ion of the same molecule, okay? So that's why it's really important to understand this, that this ratio, this um, amount of, of particles, those particles can be atoms, can be molecules, can be formula units, or can be ions. One mole of atoms, ions, or molecule contains the Avogadro's number for those particles. One mole of molecules or formula units contains Avogadro's number times the number of atoms or ions for each element in the compound. Let's talk about the difference between the molecular formula and the empirical formula. The molecular formula shows the number of each type of atom in a molecule, while the empirical formula of a chemical compound is the simplest positive integer ratio of atoms present in a compound. Okay, so most of the time the molecular, the molecular formula is different as the empirical formula, but sometimes you can have molecules that the molecular formula is also the empirical formula. As for example, H2O. H2O is a molecular formula, but also is the empirical formula because those uh, subscripts, O2 and 201, you can divide it between a, a, a similar um, digit, so you can still have the integer ratio because it has to be 2 to 1, 4 to 1, 1 to 1, 3 to 2. Okay, It could be the different kinds of ratio, but it's important that they need to be integer. Okay, they, they can be decimals or fractions. So let's see you determine the empirical formula for a compound. The compound para aminobenzoic acid, you may have seen it listed as PABA on your bottle of sunscreen, is composed of 61.31% of carbon, 5.14% of hydrogen, 
10.21% of nitrogen and 23.33% of hydrogen. Find the empirical formula for PABA. So what we're going to do is to change that, those percents to mass. We're going to assume that we have a 100%. So that means that instead of 61.31% of carbon, that represents 61.31 grams of carbon. The same thing with hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. These are previously the percent that we changed to grams by assuming an sample of 100 grams of that acid. Then we're going to divide by the molar uh, weight, okay, for each of them. Is their carbon is 12.01 grams per mole, hydrogen 1.01 grams per mole. And remember that we're going to, that also is important to understand that that molar weight, molecular weight, those are conversion factor because they have two units. The, for example, the molar weight for uh, carbon or, or basic atomic weight in this case, case is 12.01 grams per mole. Okay, so this is a conversion factor that also is the atomic weight of carbon, as well with the hydrogen, with the nitrogen and the oxygen. This, when we cancel grams, we're going to have now moles. And the next step is going to divide by the smallest number of moles that we calculate from here. So we're going to divide by 0.7288 each of this. And when we do that, we divide 5.105 5 divided by 0.7288. Now we have a 7. And we can basically round this to a 7. Okay, so this is the integer. The same thing with the hydrogen. When we divide this amount by this, it's going to be 6.984. So we need to have an integer. So integer. So that way we uh, round up this one. So it's going to be a 7. For nitrogen, it's 1. This was the smallest. So we divide by itself. It's going to be 1. And for oxygen, it's going to be 2.00 that this is equal to 2. So these are basically the coefficients of that molecule. And at the end, we're going to have C7H7 and nitrogen 1, oxygen 2. So this is the molecular formula, actually the empirical formula, sorry, for this compound. Okay, these are, this is the empirical formula for that compound. So, this is basically a, a big picture. We have the, the mass percent of element. We're going to assume that we have a 100 gram uh, sample, so that would change the percent to grams of each element. Then by using the molar mass of each of them, we're going to calculate the moles of each element. And then we're going to calculate the ratio by dividing by the smallest amount of moles. Okay, And this eventually is going to tell us the empirical formula. So by dividing that mass by the molar mass, that will give us the moles. Okay, That at the end, they're going to be the uh, coefficients for those uh, empirical formula. So one can determine the empirical formula from the percent composition by following this three steps. Okay, the first one change the percent to grams by assuming a 100 gram sample, then change that grams to moles by using the molar mass, and then change those moles of each element to the empirical formula by dividing by the smallest amount of moles. So determining determining the molecular formula. Remember the number of atoms in a molecular formula is a multiple of the number of the atoms in an empirical formula. So now we can calculate from the empirical formula the molecular formula because the, it, is, it has a uh, um, you is a multiple. You need to find that multiple okay between the molecular formula and the empirical formula. So if we find the empirical formula and know the molar mass of the molecular weight of the molecular compound, then we can find the molecular formula. So, for example, the empirical formula of a compound was found to be CH. That molecule has a molar mass of 78 grams per mole. Remember, this is the empirical formula, not the molecular formula. So what is the molecular formula? We calculate from here the molar mass, okay, that is going to be 13, and we divide 78 by 13. And this will be equal to 6. So 6 is the multiple for each of the atoms of the empirical formula. So that means that this compound is going to be C6H6. 
remember, if we have, for example, a 2 here, C2H, let's say that is C2H, then we need to multiply C6 times 2, and that will be C12 and H6. So we're going to multiply this multiple times the, the coefficient that we have for each of the elements. Remember that in empirical formula, we, we, we're not going to have always the same coefficient for each element. Sometimes we're going to, it's going to be different as the one before that we saw that it's going to, was carbon 7, nit uh, hydrogen 7, nitrogen 1, and oxygen 2. Okay, so if we calculate that multiple was 6, that was empirical, and the molecular formula, that, 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 that multiple is 6, then we multiply 7 times 6, 42, 7 times 6, 42, 7, 6 times 1 is going to be 6, and times 2 is going to be 12. In the case of the one before that we mentioned, we calculate the empirical formula. So here we just calculate the molar mass. We have the molar mass of the compound. We can calculate the molar mass of the empirical formula by looking at the atoms here. And then that we determine the uh, multiple. And by using that multiple, we multiply it times the coefficient of, of each of the atoms in the empirical formula. Now let's talk about the combustion analysis because this is the way that we can calculate the empirical formula for most of the uh, molecular compound that has carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen, hydrocarbons. So here we have, for example, there is a sample in this furnace and we add oxygen. That will, that will create the combustion. And then we can um, obtain, okay, or uh, or determine the amount of water and carbon dioxide that will be produced. Remember that we, as we showed before, the combustion reaction will produce carbon dioxide and water. And here we're we're gonna trap that product, and then we're gonna determine how mo how much how much of each we have. Okay. So the mass gained by each absorber corresponds to the mass of carbon dioxide and water produced. So these are absorbers, okay? They are basically those um, part of the instrument that are gonna receive the water or the carbon uh, dioxide. Compounds containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are routinely analyzed through combustion in a chamber like this one. Carbon is determined from the mass of carbon dioxide produced. Hydrogen is determined from the mass of water produced. And what about the oxygen? Well, the oxygen is determined by the difference between carbon and hydrogen uh, have been determined. Okay, so once we know the amount of, of, of hydrogen and carbon, we can calculate the difference by oxygen because that difference of amount is going to be oxygen. Remember that the mass, the matter can't be created nor destroyed. It can be transformed. Okay, so that's why we can do it that way. So here we have, for example, two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen producing two moles of water. This is the molecular interpretation. Here we have two molecules of water, I mean of, of hydrogen, one molecule of, water, of oxygen producing two molecules of water. And this is the mole level interpretation, two moles of hydrogen, one mole of oxygen, two moles of water. And we need to convert this to gram, okay, by using the molar mass. So the molar mass of hydrogen will produce 4 grams of, of hydrogen. One mole of oxygen will have 32 grams of oxygen. And two moles of water will produce 36 grams of water. Now, remember that we need to conserve the mass. So at the beginning as the reactant, we have 36 grams of reactant. And we're going to have here 36 grams of product. And that way we can observe that law of conservation. The coefficients in the balance equation shows that the relative numbers of molecules of reactants and products. Okay, so we have for two moles of hydrogen, react with one mole of oxygen to produce always two moles of, uh, of water. Okay, or two moles of water will produce of hydrogen will produce two moles of water, or one mole of oxygen will produce two moles of water. So these are also that ratio between those amounts are also known as conversion factor because we can uh, go from most of hydrogen to most of oxygen to 2 1 or most of hydrogen to most of water to the 2 or most of oxygen to most of water 1 to 2 okay so those are different conversion factors that can uh, do that 
relationship between those two different compounds. And the only way is through the moles. Relative number of moles of reactants and products which can be converted to mass eventually. So let's talk about the stoichiometry calculations. Here, we're going to start with grams of substance A to know how much we're going to have of substance B. So to do that, we need to change that mass of substance A to moles of substance A. And by that, we're going to use the molar mass of A. Now that we have moles of A, we need to calculate how many moles of B will be produced by using the moles of A. And to determine that, we're going to use the conversion factor produced from the coefficients of the balance equation. Okay, that's going to be a ratio of how many moles of A react with moles of B or how many moles of A will produce moles of B, the, the, this amount of B. Okay, so it's going to depend what is A and what is B. Okay, A and B could be both reactants. A and B could be one reactant and the other products, or A and B could also be both of them products. The important thing is that the only way that we can change from one substance to another one is through the moles. And once we have the moles of B, we can use the molar mass of B to determine the mass of B. We have already seen in this chapter how to convert from grams to moles or moles to gram. The new calculation is how to compare two different materials using the mole ratio from the balance equation. So that's why you need to use the moles because the moles is going to calculate the amount between two different materials. So let's do an example of stoichiometry calculation. How many grams of water can be produced from one gram of glucose? This is the equation, glucose, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. Always is going to be between two of all the possible molecules in a chemical equation. We're going to look for from 1 to 2, from A to B. In this case, A is going to be one of, uh, a, one of the reactant, that is glucose, and B is going to be water. But A could be glucose and B could be oxygen. To so set how many oxygen is going to react with this amount of glucose. Also, we can calculate instead how many grams of water will be produced. We can uh, calculate the amount of carbon dioxide that will be produced. So we can go from A to B or A to B or A to B. We have three different possibilities by using glucose as A. Okay, so we can obtain the ratio or the, uh, 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 we can compare both reactant. We can compare one reactant with another product or one reactant with the other product, okay? So there is one grams of glucose to start. So we need to calculate here the grams of water. So we have, if we have the grams of glucose, we need to turn that to moles of glucose by using the molar mass of glucose. Okay, so by using that, one gram divided by 180 grams per mole, that will produce the moles of glucose. Now that we have the moles of glucose, that is substance A, we need to go to substance D, that in this case is going to be water, and look for that ratio between glucose and water. It's going to be 1 to 6. And now we have moles of glucose, so we multiply this by 6 divided by 1, okay, because that's the ratio. So here we have that ratio, 6 mole of water is going to produce by 1 mole of, of glucose. And now we need to calculate from moles to the mass because the question was how many grams will be produced of water. So we're going to use here the molar mass of water, that is 18, okay. So in that case, we're going to have the 18 here, we'll multiply by that, and this is going to be the mass of water that will be produced by using one gram of glucose. Now, sometimes in chemical reactions of more than one reactant, one of them is going to be the limit of reactant. One of them is going to, is, is, is going to be the one that limit the reaction, even though we have an excess of the other one, but but the, this what is going to be the one that is going to limit the amount of product, okay? So the limit of reactant is the reactant present in the smallest stoichiometry amount. In other words, it is the reactant you run out first, of first. 
So this is before the reaction. 10 moles of hydrogen and 7 moles of oxygen. And this is after the reaction. You can see here that you have uh, an excess of oxygen. So that means that the you don't have any more molecules of hydrogen. So the, mo the molecule of hydrogen was the limiting reactant in this reaction. Okay, and oxygen was the excess reagent. So the limiting reactant is used in all stoichiometry calculation to determine amounts of products and amounts of any other reactant used in the reaction. So if you need to calculate the number, uh, the amount of product, you need to determine which of the reactant is your limiting reactant. And by that, that one is the one that you're gonna to use to calculate your products or the amounts of other reactant that's gonna be left in the reaction. The theoretical yield is the maximum amount of product that can be made. And you can calculate that by using the limit the reactant, okay? In other words, is the amount of product possible as calculated through the geometry problem. This is different from the actual yield, which is the amount one actually produce and measure. So the theoretical yield is a yield that you calculate, that you use a pencil and a paper to obtain that theoretical yield. The actual yield is an experimental one. Okay, you obtain that if, if it's a mass, you can obtain that from the scale, is volume, you can determine that from um, a cylinder, graduate cylinder, or stuff like that. So the theoretical yield is the one that you calculate, the actual yield is the one that you work for it to obtain that product. And the percent yield, one find the percent yield by comparing the actual the amount actually obtained, the actual yield, to the amount it was possible to make, the expected, okay, the theoretical yield. So in other words, the percent yield will be the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. That's the percent yield for any chemical reaction. And also, non-chemical reaction is 100% yield because different reasons, okay, it doesn't, it's, gonna, it's never going to be 100% yield. So that will be the end of chapter three, chemical reactions and reaction stoichiometry.